Today's scripture is from Romans 12th chapter, verse 2 and verses 9 through 21. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Now verses 9 through 21. Let love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will help burning coals on their, on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. As we continue our Siri hashtag for the family and as we unpack our Discipleship Pathways field guide, I'm really excited on this Sunday to talk to you about discipleship in the context of family living. How we can enhance our life together, not only in the life of this church, but also in the life of our family. How we can be instrumental in passing on the faith to our children, the next generation. You may remember from last Sunday where I said in the the fifth uh, law of the Ten Commandments, honor your mother and father that your days might be long in the land of the, that the Lord your God is giving you. That this commandment is not so much, I think, about taking care of mom and dad in their old age or taking care or listening to what mom and dad have to say to us, but that actually mom and dad have an important role of transmitting the faith to their children, honor your mother and father, listen to them. So as we begin our series today on discipleship, there is a major step that every parent needs to take as they uh, live out uh, as a spiritual leader in the life of their family. Now, this step you might think is a course that you might need to take because, you know, we're really good about having courses for you to help you learn everything that there is uh, about the faith, that you can study it, that you can uh, take it in and discuss it with one another and uh, then sign up for the next course uh, after the next six weeks or eight weeks or semester as we plan this out. But this has nothing to do with a course. And you might also think that maybe the first step that we might need to take to, to, for our discipleship as a family is to present our child to uh, be baptized here in the life of our church. And I would say that is a very important step in the process of, of disciplining your family in the way that leads to life eternal. But that's not the first step, but in some ways associated with it. One of the questions that I ask each parent as they bring their child to be baptized is the third question I ask. I ask them, 
Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Put all your trust in his grace and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church that Christ is open to all people, every age, every nation, every race. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior? That is the very first step in our discipling walk. It is paramount that that step be taken in our life for us to be helpful in discipling our family life in the way that leads to life eternal. Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would follow me, they need to deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. For anyone who tries to save his life will lose it, but anybody who loses their life for my sake in the gospel shall save it. It is this honoring of Christ, accepting him as your savior, putting you second behind God and deciding what is right for you and your family and your life is the first step. Now, many of us may have already made that first step. Some of us may have already confessed Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior. And we look at our peers and that we're surrounded by folks that we wish they would do the same. But we may also notice that as we look at their life and wonder whether or not they are followers of Christ or not, they may be holding up for us a mirror that reflects back our own image. Do our peers... Do our coworkers, do our friends see any reflection of Christ in us? Maybe that confession of Christ in our own life has been more of a head commitment than a heart commitment, and that our lives have not really been changed as much as it needs to be to honor much of the scripture that was read this morning from the book of Romans. It may be for us that we want to follow Jesus. We commit ourselves to coming to worship and to listening about Christ. But we may not have fully given ourselves over to him. There may even be those here this morning who are here for hashtag for the family and want their family to to really walk in the way that leads to life, but they themselves know that they have not made that commitment yet themselves personally. And that will be a obstacle for your family when it comes to helping them be discipled because you yourself are not fully committed yet. Here's Jim, you may know a person like Jim Jim really didn't have anything for or against God. He never really worked God into his life. Uh, And it seemed as if life could be run pretty well with or without God for the most part. Uh, He wasn't raised in a family that honored God in any way. And therefore, he himself had not found that place to be converted to the faith or to be introduced to God in such a way for for him to make a decision for Christ. And quite frankly, his job didn't help either. The job that he had worked himself into was one of those uh, people in the corporation that if you had a dirty job to do, he was the one that was asked to do it. If it was a little bit on the questionable ethical side of business, Jim was the man you went with because he could get it done, and get it done the way in which the company wanted it done. You needed to fire some folks, he most definitely was the person. And he kind of created a hard, tough exterior about life, a very practical approach to life. And he was also one of those ones that when he entered the office or entered a factory unannounced, it was like ripples went out through everywhere, wondering who's losing their job and what was going on. Well, you know the old saying, what goes around comes around. And, and as the business uh, downsized, uh, he was offered to look for employment somewhere else. 
So was a couple of other uh, people in the organization as well, one of which was his one and probably only friend in life. Several months went by, he hadn't seen his friend, and of course he wasn't working, he was kind of looking for work and nothing was really showing up, and most definitely nothing was showing up in the same pay scale that he was accustomed to. His friend, almost out of the blue, called him up and said, can I come over, I want to talk to you about something. He said, sure, come on over. So when he came over, there, he immediately said, I'm so glad to see you, I wanted to share something with you that happened to me in this past month while we've been out of work. He said, well, what happened? He says, my wife and my kids asked me to go to church with them, and so I went. And I'm not sure what happened. They tell me that there was nothing special going on in church that Sunday. It wasn't any different than any other so, uh, uh, service that they attended. But for me, during that service, I felt convicted that I needed something in my life that wasn't there. And that I... And that I went down front after the service and I talked with a pastor and I gave my life to Jesus. And let me tell you, it's made all the difference in the world. It's, it's taken a burden off of my shoulder. It's made family life a little bit easier. I've got, I don't have a job yet, but I'm okay. And I just wanted to share that with you. Now, while he is saying that to him, Jim is thinking, what has happened to my friend? I said, I want to be polite. I don't want to really kind of put down his experience. Now, I've heard of this man, Jesus, that he's talking about. Everybody has. I've always just, he said to himself, just seen him as a, as a teacher. Somebody who was wise and had good advice. So he just listened politely, thanked him, and his friend left. But it left him with this puzzling question because they both had worked together for many years. They'd been good friends. He knew his life. And, and so like a lot of us now, when you have a question, you, you run into somebody's experience, you just kind of go to, the, to your computer or your tablet and you go to Google or whatever search engine you like and you just type in Christianity question mark or, or issues like that. And he, he noticed that some of the books that came up uh, were by this author, uh, C.S. Lewis, and this one title which had a lot of stars next to it, Mere Christianity. He thought that sounded like a good book, had a lot of good reviews, so he ordered it. Started reading it. And it was halfway through the book, he came across this part where it just kind of like nailed him, hit him right between the eyes. He says, Jesus either is the Son of God, or isn't, or something worse. It requires our decision not to, patern not to be paternalistic or to patronize Jesus by saying he's a good teacher. We need a better definition and understanding because Christ demands a decision. Either he is or he isn't the Son of God. That's why for you and for me, we need to make that decision because it will inform everything we do next. We can't be half-hearted about this walk in which we are involved in in our life with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Remember, he says, if anybody wants to follow me, they need to deny themselves. Take up their cross, not my cross, not his cross, but your cross, our cross, and follow him. A decision needs to be made. Otherwise, if we try to help our family find faith but yet are weak in our own, we can easily be seen as somebody with a contrary mind or contrary spirit. Well, let me put it to you this way. 
I don't remember what age I was, but I can remember the day anyway. My dad, for some reason, decided he needed to have a conversation with me about smoking. He was telling me all the things that was wrong about smoking and how I shouldn't do it. Now, the interesting thing was is that the conversation about smoking started off with him lighting up a cigarette. <laughs> and he was taking his drags on his cigarette as him blowing it out as he was talking to me about this. And, and, and I think right towards the end, it finally dawned on him the hypocrisy of what he was saying. And he finally said, just do as I say and not as I we cannot have that type of hypocritical discipleship in our family. We have to be totally sold on being a follower of Jesus Christ. For if we are not, if we have not made that first step, and we're not convinced and convicted that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, so many things that we will try to help our family grow in the faith will just fall flat because it will actually lack our commitment to it as well. The second thing that I think that you and I can do to help our family and especially our children develop and their discipleship as followers of Jesus Christ is some really, some things are just very, very simple. One of which is, is to teach them to pray. There are some easy times to do this with children. Bedtime. Bedtime is an excellent time to have prayer with your children because you're ready for them to go to bed. So there can be a little mixed motivator in that. But it is that ritual that so much helps children get prepared to go to bed. And what better for a Christian family to help make sure that not only brushing their teeth or taking their bath or whatever you do to get them ready to go to bed, that, that ritual that starts each evening, that it concludes with prayer time at their bedside. Now, there are some really neat prayers. The one that my grandmother taught me and my brother and my sister is, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. God bless mommy and daddy. Now, I know that may be just a little too harsh for some of you to, uh, to to have your child pray, if I should die before I wait, that may be just a little too much. But, but I hear that there's a modern version of that now that talks about angels looking over me. So uh, you might want to use that one. Uh, I'm just sharing with the one that, that I grew up with. And that I could hear my brother's prayers because we shared the same room. My grandmother would start with me and then go to my brother and then end with my sister in another room. But that was our nightly ritual. We also said prayers at the table, prayers of blessing over our food. God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for our food. By your hands we are fed. Let us thank him. Now I'll blow it right there at the end. But those are prayers, simple little bitty prayers that, that you and I can help our children learn to share at the table, to share at bedtime, to be with them, to help them order their life. The other thing that you and I can do is, is read Scripture to them. Now, I'm not saying that as soon as you go home today, you look how to read through the Bible in a year and start reading that to your kids because not only will you almost get bored but so will your children for sure but there's a lot of wonderful children's stories in the Bible that you can use to help your children understand some of the major stories of the faith and if you're not really sure which ones those are you can kind of go to any uh, bookstore and because usually there's a book there it says uh, children uh, stories of the Bible 
And you just kind of thumb through and just drop down notes because those same stories are in the Bible. But it will be helpful for your children and for yourself that when a pastor or a Sunday school teacher uh, says uh, something, uh, I don't know, about Goliath, that they got half a clue of what they're talking about. Or when they say something about the rainbow, that they're not thinking about Lucky Charms and the gold pot at the end of it or uh, the Wizard of Oz somewhere over the rainbow, but they're actually thinking, thinking about the story about how God put a covenant with all creation by placing the rainbow in the sky. They never would destroy it again by water. These are some of the stories about Jesus' birth and his life and his interactions with children and healings that these type of stories that will follow your children the rest of their life, but maybe even more importantly as they get a little bit older is to help them memorize Scripture. You know, like John three sixteen, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. You could help them start to memorize the, the Lord's Prayer. You can also help them to memorize the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Maybe Romans 8, 28, all things work to the good who love the Lord and is called according to his purpose. There are so many wonderful little scriptures that you can help your children because not every time and at every moment will they have a Bible and maybe not even a cell phone to look up a scripture. I've been told by and recounted by folks who've given testimony in their own life where they were in such a, a state like a coma where they could hear people in the room but they could not respond to them. They heard what was going on and all they had in their head was this internal dialogue in their own mind. And the only thing that helped them keep sanity was some of the scriptures that they had memorized as a child. The only Bible they had was what they memorized. You can help your children also by making sure that they're involved in Sunday school. And you can help yourself by being in a class or a covenant group as well. The last thing that I would share with you, and I think is probably one of the more important things, is that as we have taught and hopefully are teaching our children to pray, I hope that your children know that you are praying for them. Now, I do have to say that I think very much that my grandmother prayed for me. But at the end of our prayers each night, it was always she was listening to my prayers. And she never ended with praying for me. I suggest for you that that might be an excellent ending. Is that you pray for your child and that your child knows that you are praying for them. Or that if you have family devotional time, that they hear you in that prayer time together lifting them up by name and by situation that they're going through, that they know that you care and that you offer what is going on in their life up to the Lord on their behalf. You'll never know how much that means to your child that they have a memory of looking back in their life that their parents, the ones that they love, prayed for them. It was a boy that had what I think probably today is called environmental ADHD. Environmental meaning that something had happened in his life that caused it. It wasn't something organic. And the event that had occurred in his life was his mother's passing from cancer. He didn't know why he was acting out in school. He didn't know why that every time uh, uh, somebody kind of crossed him the wrong way on the playground or 
or someone said something to him that uh, just caught him the wrong way. He didn't know that the, the anger that he had inside just would come out, but it did. And a lot of times he would get caught up in fights in school. His dad had to come many times uh, after work to talk to the principal about what his son was doing, being expelled, being a problem. His schoolwork was inadequate. But finally there was this one incident that dad had to come from work to come to school. The situation had gotten so bad that his son was being immediately expelled. His dad had to escort him off the premises. But before that happened, you know, you had to wait till dad got there. And he's just sitting in the principal's office and he's sitting outside the principal's door. And when his dad gets there, he kind of looks at him and son, you know, just looking down at the floor. Principal invites him into his office and they have a long discussion inside. Now, this principal office may be like some uh, that you may have been familiar with. I don't know if you go see the principal very often, but if you do. This particular one had, had windows in it that was colored in a way that you couldn't see, but you could sometimes hear. And so the son heard the conversation between the principal and his father about how this was the last time and, and that he's been uh, suspended and probably kicked out of school. When his father came out of the office, all his dad said was, come on, let's go home. When they got in the car, it was the quietest ride home that he's ever had. When he got to the house, he thought as soon as they got in the front door, it would all start, but it didn't. His dad says, go to your bedroom. I can't handle this right now. So 10 minutes passed, 15, 20, 25, 30. Somewhere around 25 and 30, he started hearing, sounded like someone talking in the house, but also maybe somebody crying at 45 minutes that was still going on. And so he kind of got enough nerve to leave his bedroom to, to seek out the sound that he was hearing. It was coming from his father's bedroom and the door was cracked just enough that he could see his dad and his dad was kneeling on the floor with his elbows on the bed and saying, Lord, I do not know what to do. Help me. I know my son has so, many, so much bottled up anger because his mother has died. I don't know how to help him, Lord. If you could just give me the wisdom, if you could just give me the knowledge, if you just help me understand how I could show my son how much I love him, that maybe his behavior, his actions will change. And, and this prayer would just kind of over and over and over again, just his father pouring out his heart before God about how he could be a good father and how he could better take care of his son. His son stood there in the doorway and quietly made his way back to his bedroom. He never knew his dad prayed for him. I mean, they were church people, but it didn't seem that it was that big a deal to dad. He never knew that, that his dad loved him enough that, and confused enough that he needed to talk to God about what to do and how to make life better and how to help him through his tough time. He said, but it moved him enough that he got next to his bed and he put his elbows on the bed and he prayed to God and, and that that day his life changed. It didn't get miraculously better. <laughs> but it got steadily better. 
And the relationship that he was driving a wedge between he and his father was mending and got stronger. And they both not only grew closer together, but just as importantly, closer to God. All because the son heard his father praying for him. I trust and I pray that you have a relationship with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that not only informs but empowers your discipleship in the life of your family. And that you are trying to instruct your children even in the small ways that will help them lead to life eternal, but most importantly, that you're praying for them and they know it. That will help you on your discipleship path as much as anything else. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.